In this recording we will talk about the fundamentals of object orientation and we will start with classes and objects. My name is Tobias Wolfson and this work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike. We need to uh, try to define what objects and classes really are. We have seen a lot of representations of objects and classes. For example, in the sequence diagram, we talk about objects. In the class diagram, we of course talk about classes. And in the code, we often see this uh, class uh, concept also. But what really are objects and classes? That's the goal for the next part of this video. While it is quite easy to become almost a little bit philosophical when talking about objects and classes, we will try to keep it at a pragmatic and uh, quite close to the code. Uh, so let's start with the class. A class is simply a template that we can create the objects from. The class defines what attributes should exist in each object and what operations should exist in each object. So basically this becomes the definition of the objects that we can later create. As the classes also contain the implementation, it defines the possible behaviors of the objects and also relations to other objects that the objects then can have. The class is like a template. From this template, you create objects. And by knowing the template, you basically know the structure uh, of the objects you later create. Classes generally do not exist at runtime. They exist when we model and code but when we run the system, objects are created and they execute the actual behavior of the system when it's running. Uh, this is not entirely true because we can have reflection and metaprogramming and such, but this is not part of this course really. Basically, classes are what we code. So when you code, when you implement, you define the class, you define the attributes, and you define the operations and the behavior in these operations. And you define possible relations between the objects in the class also. In this case, the dice game can have a relation to two dices. So when we create the dice game object, we have the possibility to have a relation between this object and two dice objects. And this is also what happens in the constructor of the dice game. From a class, we can then create objects when the program executes. When we create an object, we assign concrete values to all of the attributes defined in the class. So the object becomes a unique instance that is identified in some way. This means that comparison using the double equal sign generally compares the identifiers. And this is an important distinction that you need to know about. Do you want to compare the identifier or do you really want to know if an object is equal to another object? In Java, you have the equals operations that you should override if this is important to you. Uh, enums are also handled a little bit differently in Java because then, then you can use the double equal sign. To represent an object that do not exist, you can use the null pointer, but sometimes it's good to create an object with the purpose of being a null object, so to say. Uh, in, in certain circumstances, you can avoid some uh, problems and possibly get some better performance also by using a null object. Another important thing to think about when you think about objects is if you should share objects between each other or if an object requires a true copy of another object. Basically, object sharing is the norm. So if two uh, objects has a relationship to another object, Usually they share this object. And this is basically one of the advantages of object orientation, that we can share objects between uh, other objects and changes to this object becomes immediately available. You don't need to update a copy of the object all over uh, the system. Sometimes this is not uh, the wanted behavior and there can be a strict need to enforce ownership of an object. Uh, for example, in some languages you have uh, issues with the memory management. So you don't uh, have a garbage collector as uh, present in Java, but you manage the memory uh, yourself. Then it's really important to know which object actually is responsible for creating and destroying objects so that you don't get memory leaks. So in that case, there is a strict need to enforce the ownership of the objects. 
there could also be uh, cases where you don't want this state changes to be available all over the system. In that case, you need to do a copy of the object instead and uh, make the state changes locally, so to speak, and then maybe destroy this object later on. So can be important to know if you want to share the object or if you want to uh, create copies. And just using the equals operator means that you are not copying the object, but you are actually just sharing this uh, object. So let's look at an uh, example. So we have uh, two objects here, the uh, object uh, S1 and the object S2. Uh, they are strings. And the first string uh, is a new object with the name uh, Alan Turing in it. And the second object is also a string with Alan Turing in it. So uh, will S1 and S2 be equal in this case using the double equal signs operator? As you probably guessed, since we are comparing object identifiers here, the answer will be no. So because this S1 is a unique object and S2 is a unique object. In this case, they happen to contain the same text uh, so this operation, on the other hand, equals should return yes. In the second case, we have a little bit of a special case for Java. So when you create strings in this way, the compiler actually creates this object and both S3 and S4 will point to the same object. So in this case, the comparison using the double equal signs operator will return yes, because S3 and S4 point to the same object. And of course, also this equals will return true. Let's take a look at this in the debugger. So I added the example code here to a little uh, main function in Visual Studio Code and we will take a look at what happens here really using the debugger. Uh, most IDEs have a um, debugger and you should really learn how to use it because it's a really important tool. Often you can set breakpoints like that and when the program executes in the debugger it will run until we get to this statement and then we can inspect variables and see what they actually contain. So I think we should actually set the breakpoint on that row so that this first line here uh, executes. All right, let's run uh, with debugging. So the program executes, uh, two objects are created, the S1, and we can see that it contains the text Alan Turing then S2 is created and it also contains the text uh, Alan Turing. And if we compare the text S1 with S2, we get the answer no, because S1 and S2 are two unique objects that happen to have the same text in them. So the comparison here returns false uh, using the double equal signs operator. As the texts are the same in the two objects, the equals operation should, however, return true and the answer should then be yes. So let's a step and see that this happens. So we stepped and we could see here that uh, the answer became yes. And if you don't see this view when debugging, you can just press the little debug icon here. So you get into the debugging view of things. In, in some cases, you just see this. But looking at the debugging is uh, often a good thing. And especially the call stack is good to know about because here you can step between uh, functions calling each other. So in this case, we only have one function, so it's not that interesting. So uh, let's continue. Let's assign uh, the variables S1 and S2 into two new objects then. Uh, like that and we can see that the text has changed in S1 and it's uh, Margaret Hamilton again and in S2 it's also Margaret Hamilton and this time the objects are actually the same object so S1 and S2 
references the same object because this is magically created by the Java uh, language runtime and compiler. So in this case, the answer should be yes. The answer is already yes here, so we had better change it to something else so that we can see that it actually changes. So let's set it. And let's step. And the answer then becomes yes. And of course, the equals operator should also become uh, true. And thus, the answer should continue to be yes after stepping the last, last statement here. OK, uh, you can experiment with this, uh, of course, yourself. Uh, for example, you could, uh, could be interesting to know what happens if we do S1 happen in this case. You can try that for yourself using the debugger in Visual Studio Code. I now hope that you have a better understanding about what objects and classes actually are, and I hope to see you soon again. Bye for now.